we're here on the corner of this is uh, Indian School and Marshall's Way. Marshall's Way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And who are our guests? Uh, what is your name and what is your role here? At Blue so Clover? my name is Weston Holm. I'm the owner, founder, and um, artist of Blue Clover Distillery, really. And uh, here with my uh, old brother Brian, who cooks all the booze with us. So nice. nice. So do Brian. you two distill it? <laughs> As a team, yeah, absolutely. You, okay, nice. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All all the product development and stuff comes through, um, you know, my vision and stuff, and then uh, he really knows how to put it into motion. Ah, uh, man, that's that one-two punch, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, when you get the stills rolling, um, you know, sometimes on the bigger, we got a a hundred-gallon still and a thirty-gallon still. So sometimes the hundred-gallon still, it takes a couple. It, it takes a. It's a long day, so. You'll have to go and shift sometimes when, when depending on what's going on. Mm. Yeah. Does it get warm back there, Brian? Uh, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> the minute you walk through that door, you can you can tell about a twenty different uh, twenty degree difference. Wow. In, that it's warm because of the boilers and stuff. Yeah. Well, I already introduced you, but Brian, what what is what is your name and what is your role here? <laughs> uh, my name is Brian Holm, and uh, I'm just uh, here uh, trying to make the best uh, spirit possible. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> Well, you're doing a great job, man. Yeah. Excellent, excellent work. Uh, and my co-host here? Yep, Luke from A Taste of AZ, photographer, magazine guy, whatever you want to call me. Yeah, professional uh, drinker and eater yes. at this point. Now. Absolutely. <laughs> that's actually, okay, that's my new title. We need those in life. Yeah. Yes, right, right. Someone's got to do it. Yeah. <laughs> now, so are you guys originally from Arizona? No, so we, we originally grew up uh, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, so okay. just... Um, um, still a Southwest kid, right? So yeah. we're just six hours away. So this was kind of our uh, our running getaway from Albuquerque because um, that's kind of like a good place to just re- retire and golf and go to school, and that's about it, right? And then you guys wanted to get crazier. Well, we yeah. wanted we, <laughs> we 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 like a little bit more of a faster pace, even though mm-hmm. Arizona is a very laid back place, though. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But, what was what? What's Albuquerque? I've been to Albuquerque a couple times. My brother-in-law lived there, and we basically just hit up breweries. And yeah, it was great. <laughs> well, yeah, big, well, big brewery scene, right? And um, uh, the liquor laws are a little a little more stringent there. So okay. the, uh, you can do a lot more here. Phoenix is very business friendly. You know, very opening uh, economy wise, like that. So compared yeah. to, compared to Albuquerque, they're, they're pretty political with that stuff. But. Um, it's the only place I think it has some of the best weather um, because you get all four seasons you can golf and ski in the same day and I think Mm -hmm. that's pretty and you can be 15 20 minutes and you can be away and and in mountains pretty quick there so uh, that's a unique thing about Albuquerque and obviously the green chili so Uh, yeah I was gonna say food (laughs) beverage and (laughs) wonderful outdoors I mean it's it's pretty sweet (laughs) yeah good yeah good beer great craft beer scene really it really does have good craft beer scene yeah and what was sorry well, were you guys coming out to the Phoenix metro area before you moved out here? Were you familiar with it? Or oh, just yeah. Kinda? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, you know, growing up in Albuquerque, uh, you, you go to four places from there. You either come to, you come to Scottsdale to run, you know, you know, when you're in your college party years. A lot of people go to um, Austin or, or they'll go to Denver, you know, yeah. you know like the, the three adjoining states. So. Yeah, and then Vegas, obviously. Sure, Can't that's a whole different that, world, though, right? Yeah, <laughs> whole nother world. <laughs> yeah. So, at what point did you make the uh, full move out here? Well, prior prior to growing up out there, um, kind of how I got into the distilling process and really how Blue Clover was really founded and came about was um, I I built and I started up offshore oil rigs in the Gulf of uh, Tex in the oh, Gulf wow. of Mexico for a oh. while, and so um, a lot of the same ways that you process and refine diesel and hydrocarbons and gas and stuff like that is very similar to how you distill vodka mm. it's the same equipment ah, uh, interesting. so so i really just kind of took that um so i really lived in the middle of the ocean for 10 years honestly and then just stash cash and uh, what and, was that like plan that. well there's only a handful of people that get to see that <laughs> in know. life yeah uh, pretty pretty unique almost like a it uh, that movie Deepwater Horizon is almost. I mean, obviously we all know they they beef up movies and stuff, but sure. it that really was what my life was like. I got to put that on the list. I, I haven't seen that one. No, I haven't either. I probably would panic though, honestly. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, some people get landlocked. I've seen grown men cry the minute they get off the helicopter out there, and they uh, they just can't do it. Yeah, and then they fly them right back in because it's not that big of a of a area, right? I well, mean, I mean, so uh, I. They can get up to pretty big sizes. Okay. I mean, take like a football field, 
cut it in half and stack it five stories high. Mm. Yeah, see, I'm already panicking. That's already <laughs> too small for me. <laughs> yeah, I'm I mean, thinking square miles, and I'll be okay. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah. no, no. Well, you know, they rotate you two weeks on, two weeks off. You know, so a lot of my two weeks off, I uh, I, w- I would get into other ventures and investments and stuff like that, and and uh, yeah, and kind of like I'll put it together. So, so you just you started making spirits on the rigs no well oh. you can't do that <laughs> okay. i was like but i knew how yeah yeah <laughs> yeah now um so on, on my two weeks off i mean so i was kind of in houston a little bit so i had two weeks off so i'd travel all over I'd go to italy rome stuff like that and then i was like man i gotta stop just running around my two weeks off and i started putting together i don't i, I believe in not leaving a skill behind um in, in your career path no matter what you choose and so I just started writing everything down. I knew I wanted to, to own my own business in some form or fashion. And uh, on my two weeks off, I bought this old warehouse and I built it out, put small business units in it, and then built the rooftop bar for another tenant and said, nice. man, I'm doing all that. I said, I was, I'm making other people money. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go do it for myself. So I just kind of sold everything, stopped, and uh, started writing everything down and everything that led to what I feel like I would be best as a business owner was to be a, 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 a distillery owner, producer guy. Yeah. So, so you obviously knew how to distill things based on working on oil, but you didn't have plans necessarily to go into distilling and making spirits and stuff like that. Did you? Uh, no, I didn't. I, I was originally going to do like a commercial property, like investment and, and build out and leasing and stuff. But I was like, man, I, I can still do that stop do that later and actually do some and then add that other skill without leaving it behind and do the same model because we built this place ourselves my brother and i built this whole place out wow yeah you know, that's a lot so of work. were you <laughs> yeah. working alongside of him as he's doing the oil rig stuff or no i i mean just not on the level that he was doing it i used to look at some of the schematics that he used to study and was like well damn uh you know if you, <laughs> if you can do that and run this you know that this right here is child's play. The distillery yeah. here. Right. Yeah. Uh, but toy. then, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, like, I mean, I understand the whole process of, you know, uh, as far as like the gas and stuff, they're taking the water out where the only thing different here is that we're putting the water in. Okay. Uh, yeah. You know, even though you're stripping the, the mm-hmm. molecule. But, um, yeah, he called me and he said, hey, why don't we give this a shot? And so, uh, you know, I got a, a small still and started kind of playing with recipes and stuff uh, before all this came to fruition. Uh, just out in the barn, you know, back back home up in the, on the mountain there. Yeah. So, dang, that's a that's a cover of a bottle right there. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, I mean, I was, I was feeding him all the tools and information and stuff, and, uh, and then he was doing it and putting all that in motion while I was closing out all the other things, and okay. he rolled right into it. So yeah. So you guys have been working pretty closely alongside each other for the entirety of the journey to what this venture has become then. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. And so that must make things a lot easier, right? A lot of people search many years to find a good business partner. But if you got kind of one built into your life already, that simplifies things. Yeah, yeah no. for sure. I mean, you know, working with family, there's always a little bit head button going sure, on, sure. right? You know, but uh, but not not so much anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What? So how did things scale from there? You know, you talked about you're kind of experimenting at first. Was there a point where you're like, okay, we really need to start running with this? Well, I mean, money, right? So uh, you got to be in a position um, to to really, and and especially if you're adding a a full craft, like a mixology bar and a scratch kitchen, um, those are, it's really like three pumping components at once to launch in, mm-hmm. in a single day. Yeah. Right. And it's not, that was, that was probably the biggest fa- um, feat in getting it opened because you can't open up as a distillery and then not have some product, at least vodka to share and celebrate with the guests when you open your doors. Mm-hmm. So sure. that was yeah. probably the biggest hurdle was implement. Yeah. Because I, we've heard time and again, like the kitchen side of things is, is a beast. And now, <laughs> and now it turned into a giant beast yeah. right? because <laughs> of the, the work environment. Right. Uh, and, and, uh, yeah. just it, it, the, the staffing in the kitchen is difficult. Now, how did you decide on, uh, on Phoenix to, to, well, I over? mean, well, since you always come here, I always love here, always look for an opportunity to come here. Um, and then as we were doing it, 
rolling around just going and having a good time i was like man old town scottsdale does not have a distillery so we're the first and only distillery in old town scottsdale in history wow really and so i was like man so and then i was kind of looking around i was like oh i'm just gonna call this number on this window and check this building out and just kind of get some pricing on on what the space is because you can have this great business plan in any space that's available but sometimes you need to change it based on your demographic and where it's at like something might need to go out even though it sounds good on paper right so so i kind of had to play with that so you really have this idea and this scratch um business plan and then when you find your location then you can really refine it right and so so i was kind of looking around and then this place kind of found me um there was a vacant building down the way and then um it's like no 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 and all of a sudden i found a uh, a group that was buying and selling restaurants and oh you could if you gotta if you guys gotta take care of that Typical business interruptions. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Nothing no out worries. of the ordinary. <laughs> Constantly. Well, they were supposed to come yesterday. But, <clears throat> um, yeah, and then they found out that the previous person that had a, a, a bar restaurant in here was, or, was Eddie's house, right? And so we went in and took the space over there and then um, really built it out and flipped it around and got everything in six months. Wow. Wow. So was that a was that a known spot? Like was Eddie's a, a legendary spot? Yeah, here? no. I mean he's he's a great chef, a renowned chef. Um he did a lot oh, of Okay, I remember that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Eddie Eddie Matney. It, it's not Eddie V's. A lot of people think Eddie V's the chain, but it, it's Eddie Matney, right? Um um great chef. Uh I know he did a lot with the salt cellar and um places like that. Um but he, uh, he ran it here from two thousand eight. It just ran its course, you know. Yeah. Sure. Theme, themes come and go in this business really fast. Yeah. Yeah. So you said this place found you. What was that kind of adjustment period of going from find the location to actually get things rolling? So since I spent five years planning this, when I decided that's what I wanted to do from, um, it was kind of like, well, there's the place. It fits like 90% of what I have written up. And and then um, another business partner I have from Albuquerque, another investor um uh, he was ready to go uh, as soon as i was just talking about it on the moment so just all these things just kind of started falling into place and it's like well i guess that's what i'm supposed to do mm-hmm. yeah so that's well, awesome. and that's one of the interesting yeah. part of businesses as well is you spend five years planning and then it seems like something a light f- switch flips and everything is rolling and then you of course hit other hurdles and whatnot but that must yeah. have been a pretty exciting moment for you yeah very exciting right um i wanted when you live offshore in a shipping container with some other snoring dudes for a long time, <laughs> you, uh, you're pretty attentive to, to, you work a lot harder, uh, okay, to get to where you want to go if you want to open your own business from something like that. Meaning like that drive, like your memory yeah, well, those I mean, like, feelings. Um, you know, that's not really ideal for uh, family life, and yeah. a lot of people would say restaurants not either, but uh, at least I get to be my my own bed every night, right, instead yeah. of living in a bag for 10 years. So sure. Not having to take a helicopter back to uh, your I'll, actual I'll, house. I don't ever want to get on another helicopter for the rest of my no. life. Yeah. <laughs> I've, <laughs> seen <laughs> I've seen them, man. <laughs> yeah. So <clears throat> how is that kind of personal adjustment going from working in – you know, on an oil rig out in the middle of nowhere to being in an area like this that is known for being probably one of the most populated areas in Scottsdale? Well, I would come here on my two weeks off all the time as okay. I was, as I was like, um, coming out here to see a lady also, all, all obviously. So that's kind of how it really started me coming back out here, uh, through, through the course of that part of my career. So, I mean, I was, I was running around quite a bit here mm-hmm. and really like knowing what's going on. I've been here five years now. So, okay. okay. And did you come out at the same time as he did? Yeah. Well, after he he'd already been out here a little while. And then he I remember him calling me and said, well, brother, you know, uh, I was back home up on the mountain there. And he said, it, it's time. I said, it's time for what? He said, it's time to open this distillery and, and knock this, this stuff out. All right. And that's, that's when I came down. He said, let's do it, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, he was still doing all the... Um, because you can't legally distill yeah. um, by law, but he was, but up there in the mountains where we were at, it was 
best to do the product uh, development and research up there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Where no one's going to come and just show up randomly. And say, hey, what's going good, on here? Good luck finding our barn up there. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a, that's a weird kind of uh, situation to be in where it's like you're trying to open a business doing something and you're not supposed to be practicing it before you actually launch it. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, breweries, so distilleries, we're, we're kind of um, – we have a lot more um, stringent licensing and laws than breweries do mm -hmm. um, just because we're dealing with high proof um, ethanol, basically. Like a, like the TTB, your federal government license, you can give them a brewer's permit notice and start brewing beer right away and then get ready and, and then move into your opening process that way. Okay. A distillery license, it takes six months to do. They want full reports of – they want to – procedures on everything i'm sure they get those from the brewers too eventually mm -hmm. but they're allowed to start brewing beer while they're submitting all those documents to, uh, the, to yeah. the federal government i can't le legally turn on and and make booze at all until we get that license in our hand mm -hmm. yeah. so that was the very difficult part in opening the place up what kind of makes sense though too like you make a batch of beer at home like you might have some bottles that blow up but you got alcohol you you could blow some shit up right well <laughs> i mean we could kill people yeah you know? yeah so. yeah you mean with the with the product that's being produced yeah well you're yeah. coming out at 190 proof and yeah. i mean of course he's lighting it on fire out there sometimes and, and <laughs> just as a show just to get people in the door <laughs> yeah your your heart you know your heads that you know that you throw off uh and then even when you get your hearts the hearts of your cook is the only part that you keep and uh so but they you know you watch moonshiners and a couple of those guys and you, well if it burns blue right away you know you got that stuff's right on the money yeah <laughs> so we had to test it <laughs> and uh it does burn blue <laughs> yeah. is that the part of the inspiration behind blue clover uh no so um yeah, how the how the the story came about, we we obviously coming up with the name is very unique because once you have it, you're stuck with it, right? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so I was like, well, and we just have such a unique family story and history. It was uh, we had to, we we had to find a way to tie it in. But our our grandparents came over from Denmark and Ireland, and they were farmers. Oh, wow. They were farmers over there, and uh, so the blue is kind of like. Um, from all the um, fine dining scene and all over in, in Denmark and from mm. the farm, it's in all their glass stemware, the cobalt, all that stuff. And then, and then the clover's obviously the Irish site, but they met on the boat in the early 1920s during the Prohibition era, and uh, they married, and their names are etched in the stone in Ellis Island, wow, in New York. And then they migrated down and they uh, started a farm and uh, raised corn, so that's why there's corn in our products. And this is in Albuquerque. That so they moved well, to. this is the, well, this was in southern Colorado, the border of New Mexico. Okay. okay. Right. So, um, and then my dad grew up on the farm, five siblings, and then we kind of grew up running around the farm. So we're pretty much just third generation farm kids, um, just farming liquor to the table now. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. So we we literally took it through uh, generations of grain to bottle, basically. Yeah. Well, that's pretty crazy. How you know, not only did you have the knowledge of the distilling side of things from the oil refinery, but then to have the Farming. agriculture background, that is like, you don't get much more of a better the, the starting ground for something like this. Don't leave a skill yeah. behind. That's exactly. Right. Yep. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so I like that. was, you know, you said it wasn't something that you had planned on, but is it something that even growing up you had kind of a uh, realization that this might be something well, you would land on? Well, who doesn't want to own a bar when they're growing up and, mm -hmm. right, in their, especially in their early 20s? Man, if I have my bar, we'd, you know what I mean? It'd be the coolest place in town. It'd be the coolest place in town. I mean, <laughs> who doesn't want to own their own bar, yeah. right? Uh -huh. um, so that has always been in the picture. Um, and then uh, the rest was just finding, well, how to really wrap the rest of it around so and so you know we talked about it a little bit but what was that journey like you know when did you add the restaurant side of things and how did you kind of wrap the, your hands around that the day of i mean okay. that, all three were open the same day or do you mm. mean like the, the the idea of it or the concept so of it? once you i mean like if we were going to open up just another regular restaurant in old town scottsdale that'd be a dumb idea right but sure. the fact that you have a distillery that goes with it the food component was an easy piece to add to it um 
everybody needs to eat when they're drinking for and, sure and we, we encourage that mm-hmm. you don't want them leaving right to eat yeah right? <laughs> i mean i mean you know and then when you come back everybody's done eating when you come back I and mean, we still have like great bar snacks and stuff so we, we serve late but a lot of people drink later too yeah yeah what does your uh food menu look like well, right now we've been um, obviously with the. I mean, there's not one conversation that goes on right now with anybody that doesn't involve the pandemic, right? So, sure. sure. Um, we we had a full conglomerate menu, and um, it was, everything was scratch ma- scratch kitchen made. And it still is, but we, we're really down to a limited menu right now. We're doing build your own pizza, build your own salad, calzones, wraps, green chili cheese fries because we bring our own chili from. Ooh. New Mexico and we roast it mm. and uh, and then make, make make stuff with the chili that we bring from the farm farmers there and uh, and then some nachos and, and, and stuff like that so as we get through this summer and fall comes around and we see what's really going on uh, is when we're going to uh, make those adjustments you had me at calzone man <laughs> yeah. I got like a good calzone yeah I mean <laughs> And again, you pizza know. and booze is really hard to go wrong. That's why so mm-hmm. many people do it too. Sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And not that, you know, more options is a bad thing, but that's a pretty great starting menu. Pizzas, calzones, nachos. I mean, that's yeah. like yeah. a green chili, <laughs> green, green chili cheese yeah. fries. So that's probably one of the, that's probably one of the best sellers. Yeah. Yeah. People Just because of the nachos. No, no, the green chili cheese fries. Okay. okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Man, I'm very hungry now. Real, <laughs> real green chili. Well, we're, so every year we do a, a. I mean, right now we're chili roasting season comes in the fall, and we're doing. Um, we're, we're having a, a a green chili roasting festival here on September 24th and 25th. Oh wow! And so we're partnered with AJ's and Bashes. Um, wow! So I'm actually going to be one of the judges for their green chili menus over nice. there. Um, and, and then they're all, and then we've got like five bars and restaurants that are coming in to do a cocktail competition with our green chili vodka on the 25th nice. and nice. lots of prizes and stuff like that so come on by you said yeah. what dates again that it will it, it's an all weekend roasting event but the 24th september 24th but the 25th is when we're going to have like the the mixologist from tar bells the italian daughter very cool tipsy cactus um a couple um, six people come here and they're gonna duke it out with their spicy vodka and nice. put a show on for everybody. And so you've got products in distribution all over Arizona, right? Yeah, we're we're probably in uh, close to 350 to 400 bars and restaurants. Um, wow, luckily, and then um, we're in AJ's, a great partner there. Um, Total Wine, um, Costco, we played with a little bit. Um, Trevor's liquor store, a new liquor store opened up down the street. Great spot. Everybody's getting yep. to know those guys. Um, Devil's Liquor, Sellers Fine Wine, and uh, all over places like that. That's so. really cool. Yeah. So it's we're busy. We're busy outside of here too, because that's a whole nother game. Is yeah. the distribution keeping those those accounts full and all that? Yeah, and yeah. Then, and then when the pandemic hit. Then what happens? Right, retail mm-hmm. goes up. All that. Yeah. So yeah. I know things are in flux right now. You don't need to give exact numbers, obviously, but like what percentage of your business um was distribution and then how have things kind of changed more recently so when you start a liquor brand um the 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 good idea behind the food in the bar is is you get a lot of people through the door so that's a different way of grassroots marketing so if you look at how much we pay for in rent that kind of went towards our marketing of a liquor brand right instead of just having a distillery and then trying to run and market it through sure Instagram and stuff like that. They can feel it, touch it, taste it, see it being made here. Meaning as opposed to not having a spot for people to come in and right. enjoy it like that. Yeah, it, that, that makes it difficult. Like a lot of wineries have tasting rooms in town, you know, but um, they're for their, I mean, they got the big farms and the vineyards out there, right? Sure. So um, th- there's a little gap in, in, in the communication with some of that stuff. So we try to put it all in here and you can do that with spirits. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and, you know, we're sitting at the bar right now. You look over to our left and you see the whole system there. You see that with breweries, but not too many distilleries do right. you see the system on display. And so yeah. that's got to be a pretty unique opportunity for people to not only become exposed to it, but then I, I figure you'd probably introduce some educational components as well when people are tasting it here and they can see that there. Oh, hands down. Um, 
You know, the craft brewery scene, we all know, is saturated. Um, if you're going to op- open up a craft brewery, it needs to be in a whole brand new community that's been built. It needs to be a neighborhood bar brewery, right? Mm-hmm. In my opinion. Sure. So, yeah. but distilleries are kind of on a boom right now, especially here in America. And <clears throat> so we still get so many people that come in and they're like, oh, well, what kind of IPA do you have on tap? I'm like, well, we're a distillery. Mm-hmm. And then they said, be like, okay, well, what kind of, uh, what kind of like a wheat beer do you have? Sir, distillery is booze and brewery means beer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we're a distillery. <laughs> so we're doing a lot of education and that's why a lot of people are learning what a distillery is still. Yeah. When I feel like if you walk around Old Town, which is, you know, heavily saturated with alcohol in general, a lot of people that you pull might not even realize you know what a growler is which is on the beer side of things obviously um but you know i I bet if you pulled 10 people off the street and asked them you know where's the closest distillery they wouldn't even know that maybe there's a distillery yeah (laughs) point to gold water sure yeah Yeah, exactly yeah right because there's someone who's been around a little bit doing good beer so Mm -hmm. yeah that is very true yeah so so now when the pandemic hit um to bridge some of that communication actually we we rolled into making hand sanitizer to mm-hmm. survive which what you can do in a distillery and some breweries can do it but not all it's completely different equipment similar but different right okay. so so we we made so much of that stuff and then people really learned what a distillery was during that actually so we're, sure. we're, we're thankful for that part and that adjustment in the business what is the uh like the biggest shock to people is it like you were saying just that distillery doesn't make beer or is it do you get more into the weeds of the process and stuff like that, that they begin to understand that beer is almost like a precursor to alcohol yeah, in a certain way? I mean, you know, so some of that di- uh, gets a little difficult when we're super busy because people are trying to want to know. And it's like, I don't have time to tell you how to teach yeah. you how to make alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right yeah. Now. You would love to. I'd right love in the to. right place. Yeah. 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 So because then it just it, it does it gets their wheels turning on because it, it is very complex. Yeah. Do you guys do tours or anything like that? Well, not because it's set up where you can see it, touch it, feel it, right? Uh, Uh, Yeah, yeah. I I mostly have that set up for liquor buyers and um, stuff like that that I walk through and and show like that. We do do tours. It depends on the time and place. But when uh, we're we're, we're a bar and a restaurant, so adding another tour in in the middle of that, like we're we're not there yet. Sure, sure. Do you guys like regularly? We do them all the time. Okay. It's just kind of like... You got to catch us at the right moment, and then we do it. Are you guys typically pr- producing while the place is open? Because I saw you guys have two days that are production days, so you keep it shut down on days that are like people. Yeah, are I mean, originally we were open uh, seven days a week, but our production went up because uh, of all the great local love and support here. Yeah. And so Mondays and Tuesdays. Well, Mondays I sleep unless we need to make some booze, or, but he's always here on on those days. Because it out. Yeah. if we get we get up and going like uh, our big tables out here and stuff, we'll, we'll we'll get a few bottlers going on in here. So okay, mm. nice. So what do you have? Like what take us kind of through your lineup of what you have? I know Brian was pointing specifically yeah, at, at one down there. Away. So uh, <clears throat> well, just the ones in front of us here is uh, we have our gin, uh, which is very floral, and uh, I'll give him credit on that recipe. Uh, it took him uh, to dial it in. Uh, about 88 batches yeah <laughs> wow. approximately 80 80 <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a, it's a fruit forward floral gin so, okay yeah we put um like blood orange some rose some local prickly pear so it's kind of like a southwest type gin wow interesting and then nice. um some peach fresh ginger and a little bit of lavender in it so it's really low in juniper berries so it doesn't have like that big pine taste that most people have bad sure. thoughts of being yeah. called drinking Bombay or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> so if you're not watching the podcast and you're just listening, the, the gin is completely clear. That must be, I would think that's hard to take those notes and translate that in if you're sucking so much out during the process of distilling. Yeah, it is. It's just to make a small, um, small 30 gallon batch of gin. It, it takes about, seven to nine hours wow uh, and that's after you know it, it's mashed and it, it, yeah th- that's that's from the start of the cook from from firing up the boiler to and that's not even finished product you know that's just the cook 
Okay. And then, uh, then you proof it, you know, and proof it down and whatnot. And, um, so to, to do a, a batch of gin, it, it takes a little more time, yeah. uh, to do it right. Is and, that uh, one of your more complex products to make? Hands down. Mm hmm. Yeah. Cause you got, everything has to be exactly weighed, you know, so that you get consistency. You sure. know, you don't want, you don't want your gin one day to be nice and floral. And then the next day tastes like you've been into a pine tree. Yeah. You, you, right. So yeah. we would literally yeah. use like a big weed scale okay. <laughs> yeah. to, get down to, the, to get down to the grams. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, on top of the fact that it has to be dialed in very much. So in terms of the measurements and whatnot, but on top of that, it's an agricultural product using For the components sure. that you're using. So you get fluctuations in, how the product is going in, Seasons, let alone the weights. Yeah. Just like chili comes in fall only. Marijuana is harvested in the fall only. Similar, similar uh, seed. Mm -hmm. uh, fruit comes through the valley, you know, seasonally. So. Well, and then to yeah. make your life more difficult, you have a pepper vodka down there, which is the uh, hatch chili infused one, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So how It'll does light it light you up, man? Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is that predominantly for cocktails or is it a sipper as well? Cocktails. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's more to put in like a sweet and spicy type cocktail. Sure. But if yeah. you do like, uh, you know, like the, the great thing about the pepper and the green chili is, yeah, it's got a little heat to it. It's not like a habanero heat, but it's more of a green like, uh, vegetable you know what i mean like yeah. a, like yeah. a fresh garden uh yeah. flavor and i mean yeah a lot of mixed drinks but it's also really good just by itself over ice mm. if Which you're just sipping I, I would like to try it as next yeah. okay so we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll uh, yeah we'll go pour one yeah and, and, and oh, thanks, we, we'll, we'll do um, <laughs> i was got, talking about he, after but uh, uh, yeah man. <laughs> I mean, what else you do on a podcast right <laughs> <laughs> um, but we you know it really it really actually is the best thing for Bloody Marys. So uh, that's exactly what I think of with it with that. Yeah. yeah well, cause a lot of people, when they make a Bloody Mary, um, and in my opinion, there's two drinks out there in the spirit world that are the most difficult to make for the general public. And that is a dirty martini with vodka as simple as that sounds. It's not. And then a uh, Bloody Mary. Cause everybody has this idea of what it's like to have, what the Bloody Mary should taste like. Sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's why so many people got hooked on Zinzan because like that was the first big general product that tasted good, yeah. and and it gave it that type of a uh, that idea of what a Bloody Mary should taste like, right? Yeah. So that's why you right? you'll go yeah. one, you're like, nah, that Bloody Mary tastes like shit, right? <laughs> yeah, right? And then like, what's going on with all that? Well, it's because you're mixed, and when you put a spicy Bloody Mary, too much Tabasco sauce has too much vinegar in it. <laughs> Yeah, mm. so that that's what washes away your aftertaste mm. in the Bloody Mary, is the, the vinegar. The vinegar, yeah. So if you use, the, uh, so if you're gonna spice it, so this gives a natural heat, so you're not washing the. You get the full Bloody Mary taste. The vinegar will, will, will kill your Bloody Mary. Sure, yeah. I mean, it just it sounds too much vinegar. I'm not you need a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> I'm not a huge Bloody Mary guy, but something about having the pepper be a component of the actual spirit itself sounds really, really appetizing, and it's. A relatively unique experience you know obviously there's plenty of uh bloody marys that probably use something along the lines of what you're creating here but not on a local level and not crafted right next to where you're sitting at the bar and yeah the yeah. the history of um hatch chilies as far as your family's lineage and whatnot is a very interesting component of the story as well yeah all those i mean you're getting a bloody mary in from the spirit with the spice all the way through your actual mix mm -hmm. so yeah and for someone who maybe doesn't like the um super super punchy flavor of your typical bloody mary just drink that straight and you're, you're good to go right yeah so you're, good, you're good to go yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is uh wh what else do you have here you have a vodka in front of us as well so so the vodka i mean like i mentioned kind of in the story of the of the farm the the vodka's corn based so it, i mean of course it's gluten-free everybody likes to know that of course they label all liquors gluten-free now which it really is uh, okay yeah. always has been Always well, has yeah. been. <laughs> <laughs> when made properly, right? Okay. And okay. When, when you have a proper stripping tower, uh, it, it strips out because when the fermentation process is done, you actually cook it off. There's no more. There, it takes all that stuff out. You got straight ethanol. So, so it's not As lying, opposed but to it's like <laughs> with beer, you have a lot of the residual components Correct. of the grains left over, which is where the gluten is contributed from. Correct. Okay. And so how would you describe your vodka? 
So, I mean, we're, we're pretty much, well, Tito's is corn, right? So we're pretty much a true handcrafted corn Tito's vodka, local, like a local Tito's basically. Sure. Yeah. And so is this, do you, do you personally enjoy it straight sipping it or is that another big cocktail one? I like dirty martinis with it, honestly. Okay. Yeah. No vermouth, straight olive juice only. A lot of people get that mixed up. Like I was telling you, the other most complex one. And on a scale of one to ten, how dirty, right? Because you can never get that right either. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah. So well, and especially with people's changing tastes, one person's perfect martini is another person's worst martini. Yeah, ever, the worst right? martini <laughs> ever, right? Well, I will, bro- yeah. Ver- so yeah, some people love vermouth, and some people don't. You either do or you don't, and that really makes or break your martinis. When people come in and enjoy cocktails, I mean, considering you're not only just purchasing, it's not like you're purchasing spirits. Obviously, you have some over here but you have your lineup to not only handle the complexity of that and the food and then the bar side of things as well to be Mm -hmm. making cocktails that you obviously very care you care very much about about making them perfect was that something that you were into before this or was that just another thing that you added to the list of things to learn oh no i mean absolutely i mean i mean who i was dating was in the the wine sales rep scene so we were already kind of running through bars and seeing what was new and what was hot and all that stuff. But I love, I like the spirits more than wine, obviously. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's something that, Oh wow. Look at this guy. Wow. Dude, thank you so much. What do we, what do we got here? So what will this, this is just a bloody Mary with the green chili vodka. And then that's just a green chili uh, pepper vodka just over ice. Just like I requested. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thanks man. I appreciate that. First, yes, I do. Brian, thank you so much. Yeah. I didn't know exactly what you were doing over there because I was looking over here, and then he comes over with these beautiful uh, two drinks. You know, one is just straight over ice, and then <laughs> this Bloody Mary. I, I can smell it right now. That is a potent <laughs> smell. It's actually very manageable heat too. It's not. Yeah, yeah it's. I like it. Could the tobacco, right. you know, that, that's why the Tabasco in Bloody Mary it kills it, in my opinion. Well, that is as I said before. I'm not a big Bloody Mary person, but that yeah. is a good Bloody Mary. Yeah. I enjoy the taste of that and. The flavors are super balanced. It doesn't just punch you in the face with a load of spice. It's a very refreshing taste, honestly, which I don't know if yeah. people typically classify Bloody Marys as that, but it is. Well, the, well, the <laughs> heat, it, it gets a little warmer as you as you drink it, and, it, and then it'll just kind of sit on your palate and then kind of tone out. Yeah, and I just took a sip of the um, just the pepper vodka over ice, and um, wow, that is yeah. delicious. Yeah, because yeah. we've had plenty of stuff where... You drink it, and as it goes down, it almost feels like acid reflux is instantly hitting you (laughs) as soon as you take a sip of it. That's nice and mellow in terms of how the heat hits you, but it's also very flavorful, Yeah, which I didn't necessarily expect it to have that much flavor to it for being just a spirit. Yeah, well, what we did was we added um, jalapeno in with it, and then we added a bell pepper. So bell peppers Mm. are sweeter, so that's kind of what gives it the smooth finish, too. Very interesting. And I would say, too, like, typically, like, when you're, um, I don't know, especially vodka on the rocks, right? Yeah. (laughs) You're you're doing that, but right about you're about to take that first sip, you can smell it, and Mm -hmm. you're like, oh, shit, what am I in for right now? (laughs) With this, you get the smell of that pepper. Like, it's, it's like, the Mm -hmm. smell is almost as enjoyable as the taste of it. Like, it's, like you said, farm fresh. Like, Mm -hmm. it really has a farm fresh taste to it. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. It, It almost tastes like you took the components that you actually have in the spirit and mashed them up in a glass with it that's how fresh it tastes which is it must be a pretty difficult thing to knock out of the park yeah well and we do that with all of our flavors too they all sit in there and infuse i mean he can kind of talk more on the infusion process how do you infuse them (laughs) well it it all depends but um sometimes it goes uh you know in the mash before uh depending on you know the flavor profile you're looking for and other times um when you're infusing it, you let it sit at a higher proof so you get maximum extraction uh, of the natural fruit and or pepper or whatever you're going for uh, as far as uh, flavor profile. Um, and Yeah, because water and oil separate. So if you have too much water in the batch, then it, the flavor fights and infuses in the water instead of in the booze. Okay. Yeah, mm-hmm. like technically. And then it'll get distilled off? No, that's already distilled off. Okay, okay. And then Distilled, purified. You know, everybody, uh, 
talks about how, oh, this is this and that is that. And the best way I can put it is, is that we hold our standard higher than the industry standard. Sure. And uh, I invite you to put it up against anybody's uh, because I know the love and, and the care that goes into making this stuff. And uh, well, so there's obviously a very, very scientific component of it. But the way you talk about it there, you get some of that artistic confidence of, you know, you've been doing this enough times and you care so much about it that it is an art, obviously, as well. What degree of flexibility do you have to take for tasting the components before they go in because of the modifications in terms of seasonality and things like that? How much are you having to toy around with things as opposed to just kind of putting Never it ends. into a formula? Never ends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's always refining, refining, experimentation. refining. Yeah, we, we, I mean, and if, like you said, compare it, and if you find something else, we'll taste it, we'll figure it out, we'll refine it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, what does that process look like? Is it just sitting down and tasting it and tasting it against old batches, or? Well, yeah. I mean, and when we go into the field and we see this, a, a new cocktail, or, uh, you know, these bartenders are very savvy in this town, and they're great, and they're, there might be like a great cocktail that they've made something new with our gin on the menu and we're like man how come we didn't think of that for our own bar right mm. so <laughs> yeah a lot of product research like that that's got to be a lot of fun too you know not only going out and enjoying a nice drink but meeting these people that are super creative yeah absolutely it, it's all um, we're all very similar people in nature in this industry i believe sure yeah yep i agree and so <clears throat> are these aren't all the products you have are they no no, we got, so the leaders here, this is mainly for all the local bartenders and stuff, you know, because, the vodka. uh, yeah. okay. and the gin comes in the leader as well. Okay. Uh, you know, mainly the longer neck for the wells and stuff. So it's easier to grab and, and, uh, more, uh, bartender friendly. Sure. Uh, and then we have the seven fifties, which we have all of our, uh, flavors. We got strawberry, blood orange, pineapple, um, barrel aged gin which is all in these barrels Ooh, uh, nice. back over here behind us that, that are aging uh, we do have some that uh, is available to taste i'll give you guys a taste of that next if you like sure. uh, sign me up <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah you gotta try the barrel aged gin that yeah that's probably our most complex all the way from start to finish mm -hmm. liquor and the and uh, I don't know if you all are old fashioned type mm -hmm. gentlemen. Yeah. Well, then I'm going to make you an old fashioned with the uh, <laughs> barrel aged <laughs> gin. Yeah. Okay. Because, you know, it has a smoky flavor. And again, uh, well, heck, I'm going to get off and go make them right now. And I'll be right <laughs> Before back. Before you go, what type oh, yeah. of uh, barrels is it aged in? I believe these are. So it's a, wi wi it's a white American oak with a single char. So it's okay. actually a whiskey barrel. Okay. So, yeah. So the. So. Our, our gin is so unique and really our flagship, uh, honestly. I mean, vodka's great, right? You got to have a good base spirit to make it, to have to make a good gin, period. Yeah. Okay. And so, so since it was so unique and such a Southwest type type of gin, I was like, well, I mean, bourbons are all over, whiskeys are all over. Um, there's some great ones out there, so we're not trying to recreate the will. Um, so we're like, man, why don't we take our actual hard fought two-year really research and development on the gin and age it in a whiskey barrel and see what happens right yeah and, and uh i'm gonna say we got lucky on the first try wow so and you know we touched on the artistic component and the always experimenting you said it never ends never ends. that's got to be a great feeling when you land on something that you don't know how it's going to turn out and you take a sip of it and you're just blown away well whiskey is yeah. extremely difficult because one, you gotta have a lot of money to start a whiskey brand because mm -hmm. you gotta take into account you're gonna dump all this money out and it takes three years to age one. So before you even start bottling it up and then get your marketing going, turn around and sell it. I mean, you're looking at a long haul when you're starting a whiskey, a whiskey brand, honestly. Sure. And so a three-year whiskey is not really like it's not a real big draw, right? Uh, <laughs> like uh, you, unless it is like cooked and made and the perfect barrel is purchased yeah right yeah and, and then you can get one otherwise right? you got to let it sit there much longer much longer yeah yeah mm -hmm. so we use a 10 gallon barrel um, because the aging process is more aggressive for square inch circumference to liquid versus like you take it and put it in a 65 gallon barrel you got more liquid to oak so it takes the three years to age ah. so in a 10 gallon barrel we're able to age it faster 
Ah, interesting. Okay. It's a more aggressive age. Sure. Right? Yeah. Speeding it up a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So for someone like myself that isn't super versed in the way spirits are created, what differentiates a vodka from a gin from a whiskey? So all whiskey goes into a barrel clear, and then the barrel is what turns your, your uh, brown liquors brown. Mm-hmm. And then whether or not it's more burnt or whatever, like or a different type of oak or um, or a different type of, type of wood barrel, um, that's what really is the difference. Now, a lot of whiskeys uh, are made with rye base, um, like instead of corn base. Like, so you can have corn-based whiskey, right? Um, wheat is a big one, too. So like, uh, and sometimes they'll add wheat and rye, right? So, um, so for someone coming from a beer background, that's almost a little bit counterintuitive if you can put it that way, because with beer, the malt that you're using to create the beer determines the color of it. Whereas when you're distilling a spirit that strips away the color and all the color through the stripping column. Yep. And so not only is the barrel adding the color component, but it's also adding flavor components and whatnot as well. And so, you know, as someone who's had a lot of different, a decent amount of different barrel age stuff, um, I'm excited to try the barrel aged gin because that's something I've not witnessed before. Well, it's completely unique. And because of all those botanicals I was talking about earlier, I have so much characters in it that you don't need to age it longer than six months in a 10 gallon barrel. Like it already gives it the finish. If I did not tell you that you would think it, that it was aged much longer mm. like when you taste it. But So what differenti- differentiates vodka from gin then? So your vodka is your base product. And then um, it's almost like, I mean, making tea you know like london Mm. tea they came out with gin first them and the scott you know scotland all the so you're basically taking vodka and basically putting a tea bag of botanicals in it and then cooking it off okay it's infusing with the actual Mm -hmm. botanicals and that's all gin is so technically gin is just a flavored vodka Mm -hmm. (laughs) i didn't know that (laughs) yeah i I probably should know that but that's uh Yeah. yeah so then that way there's so many different components so there's tons of ways to make gin and infuse the botanical into the actual, you know, vodka base, right? Um, you can put, so like a couple of the, like old school distilleries in in uh, London, what they'll do is, uh, it, you'll, it, you hear blended all the time, blended whiskey, blended gin, right? With some whiskeys can be like, this this rye this whatever this whatever in these four different barrels and then they blend that all together put it in a bottle and then that's your blended whiskey right yeah so that's that's different there so but um gin like the like one company will take each individual botanical soak it in the vodka base then cook it off hold it in a container and then they'll take however amount on each different little batch of that individual botanical that they've done and then they'll blend that in together and then make gin like that to really Mm. dial in what flavor components they want to shine that's how they'll do it Ah. very interesting yeah because i mean just even trying to comprehend the base level of it let alone the (laughs) actual execution of it i know i lost you there for a minute (laughs) no no it's it's uh it's an exciting thing because it's like it really is so much more artistry than the average person sitting here at the bar enjoying this bloody mary might realize um but you can tell that you guys get really excited about that and have a passion for it and i think that articulates when i'm having probably one of the first bloody marys that i keep going back for multiple multiple (laughs) more sips now because it's just so delicious yeah yeah, I mean, it. you're not going to, because we enjoy it so much, I mean, is why we love coming to work every day. Mm-hmm. I don't care who you are. If you don't like what you do or you're not that excited about it, or you're not going to last very long. Sure. Right? You're going to be looking for something else. So. so when you began experimenting with all these different things, was that – to try and stand out was that just something that you guys wanted to do or did it just kind of happen upon you no um i kind of took that from a more of a high level approach so i was like well we're gonna have a distillery we're gonna have a craft mixology bar here and so that alone allows me to play with things and use the general public to get like a like i can go pull up in the system which flavor does best Mm. so i can learn what 
is going on with people more on a percentage level before I take it to the distribution company mm-hmm. and be like, hey, I have proof on what on what is sold the most. And our new best friend just arrived with what I believe is the <laughs> barrel aged gin. Yeah. Thank you once again. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, he's got a he's got a oh he's got the old fashioned with it as Give well. That a smell. That's fantastic. It yeah. smells fantastic. I like just smelling things more than I like I'm going to dab it on my wrists and <laughs> <laughs> it on my neck here. Enjoy the day. <laughs> See you guys later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is an old fashioned, but with gin instead of the, instead of whiskey. Yeah. Wow. That, uh, did you try nice. it straight too? I sniffed it straight. <laughs> 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 oh man. What, what is this? Just some of the different flavors. Ah, beautiful. So, some of the different flavored vodkas. Tell me to get on the mic. These are all vodka infused, correct? So I have a blood orange gin infused um, that we made like blood orange gin martinis with. But he probably, I'll let him tell you what he poured you. Sure. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah, this is just, I don't even know if I'd want ice with this. Yeah, just no, drink it's really good. Yeah. And yeah, a lot of people come in, we'll drop like a ice cube in it. Sure. Yeah, like that. just kind of, they say to open it up. Mm-hmm. I never believe that, and then I try to make well, it. Oh, yeah, well, because <laughs> you know what it does is it starts proofing your, your booze down when you add ice to it. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, so, like, so a lot of people, when they say on the rocks, they're, they're just slowly proofing it down as the ice melts. It's reducing the alcohol content in your glass. Uh, yeah, yeah. So give us the rundown of what we have here in front of us. Yes. Uh, okay, so uh, <clears throat> that's called our flight board. Uh, you get your choice of uh, four uh, per flight. And right there we have strawberry, lemon, blood orange, and grapefruit. And there's still more up there. We also have a magnum habanero and a lime. Oh, wow. And then uh, then it switches over to gin towards the end there. And there's the pineapple gin, um, blood orange gin, peach gin, and then... Um, uh, we have a pecan whiskey also on the farm. Oh, really? Wow. Mm-hmm. And is that pecan whiskey? You guys make really the pecan whiskey or? No, it, we just, I didn't want, I mean, as we get more of our barrel aged gin product going, since we really just launched that in the last year, we're, we're, we're going to end up putting it in a jar with pecans and then giving it a, like a pecan wash type whiskey sour with mm. it. I like that. So it'll be big pecan wash barrel aged gin sour, basically. Wow. And so I just tried what what flavor is this that I just tried? That would be Strawberry? That would be the blood orange, I believe, on the end. Blood uh, coming from this way to that way, it goes blood orange, uh, grapefruit. Or I'm sorry, it goes strawberry, grapefruit, blood orange. Okay. Uh and or lemon, I'm sorry. Strawberry lemon. <laughs> so that that one on the very end would be a uh, grapefruit. We get dizzy ourselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's all right. Well, so when you try flavored spirits, a lot of the time it is very, very fruity, and you don't get any of the character of the original spirit that it was in. I've only tried one so far, but it's not overwhelmingly fruity. Was that the direction you guys were trying to go with it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. just a, just a clean flavor, right? Yeah. Almost no. where it's it can be kind of difficult to put your finger on, like, what is that? Like, that's yeah. fantastic, right? No. That's that's a good thing if you can't be like, oh, my God, that's orange. Like, that's yeah. usually not no. a good sign. <laughs> yeah. Depending on the season and the fruit, like, if it's, um, like, out of season and, the, you know, we all, we've all had limes that are super bitter, mm-hmm. right? So we'll, uh, when that, that happens, we'll put just a very, very, very small amount of sugar in there just to pop the fruit flavor out a little sure. bit. And that's it. And so you're not using concentrates for these flavoring. It's no, actual no, no. fruit. Actual fruit. Yeah. In the bucket, at high proof, infused, and then proofed. You guys just don't like making your job any easier for yourselves, <laughs> do you? <laughs> no. <laughs> but yeah, again, I mean, there's good local fruit here. You know, and we're in a citrus valley, and that's kind of what, like, kind of back to the high level of the, the bar. It's kind of like, well, like, what do you have around you? Where are you located at? What... The fun thing we get to play at the bar, so like we're in, we're in a citrus valley. The the grapefruit and the lemon started when they, we just had regulars that started just bringing us their grapefruits wow, really? and lemons yeah. off their trees in their backyard, and that's how we started that. 
no. by the cases. <laughs> really? Just we, had to, yeah. we had to dog them off. We're like, hey. <laughs> this is too much. We have no more stories. <laughs> like, we yeah. appreciate y'all. Here's a free bottle of booze. Thank you so much. And, you know. Well, some of those oh, no, some of those lemons I remember that, that are local, they look the size of grapefruits. Wow. The lemons. You know, yeah. you'd see them. You're like, are you sure that? No, it's a lemon. I mean, but they were huge. Huge. Wow. And so that's, you know, you're not even dealing with like a... Um, a big agricultural company that's trying to dial in the consistency and things like that. So how are you guys incorporating that stuff? Are you squeezing it out and tasting a little bit, or are you just kind of riffing with it? Well, you always got to taste it. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, research and development every Monday and Tuesday. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. But so walk <laughs> us through this uh, Manhattan, or excuse me, Old Fashioned old again, because yeah. this is yeah. fantastic. Barrel aged in Old Fashioned, yeah. And, you know, you got to have a good... Um, old-fashioned process of making it to to have a good old-fashioned in general anyway mm-hmm. so well i go up to take a sip and the orange is amazing it's so refreshing smelling well those are our own, our, those are our own our orange bitters that we make here and distribute too Ooh. oh wow. yeah you make your own bitters so nice. let's dig into that a little bit you yeah. that's a recent product edition right yeah well we'll dig into that and then he can tell you how we make the old-fashioned sure sure so, yeah but, but i mean we, we basically um, TTB came out with the new law um, where a, a lot of bitters manufacturers and AZ bitters went out of business here and hearts go out to them. I hate when the, anybody puts their mm-hmm. life on the line for their own business and something like that happens. But um, the whole pandemic and the glass and getting bitters from a lot of them come from Europe and stuff like that has been a little difficult. So we're like, man, well, we have a DSP license, so we all, we have all, we're in all compliance to do it. And so we jumped right into making local bitters too. So um, all that's the same thing, all organic, same thing, Citrus Valley. So this is all an organic citrus, orange, singed orange um, bitters that we make here. Do you sell those? Yeah. Just sell, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nice. Yeah. So with that note, kind of walk us through this old fashioned then. Yeah. So yeah, the old fashioned, uh, again, was with the barrel aged gin uh, that you guys tried all by its uh, mm-hmm. self. Um, then we mix it, you know, with, with the sugar, uh, the raw sugar with the spoon and the bitters. Uh, then we add the the aged gin to it and, you know, you know stir it just slightly. You only give it a couple shakes. Uh, then, you know, pour it over, strain it. Um, and then the the bitters uh, that we yeah. make, just, just about four little dashes per per glass that's it four drops is all you need and then with that orange peel and then the cherry of course that kind of completes the old-fashioned but uh it really helps the citrus side of it Mm -hmm. open up as well as you get the oaky nice oaky smooth finish from from the barrel aged it's a little bit less punchy on the spirit side than your typical Mm old-fashioned so if you are an old-fashioned person it's still obviously delicious but if you're not a big old-fashioned person, this, to me, is one of the first ones that you should go and try because it's... it's you could drink it. Exactly, yeah. It's not, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, it's right. it's not, not aggressive. aggressive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there's no burn to mm-hmm. it. It's smooth. Mm-hmm. Well, and a lot of that is, like, when we make the bitters, we'll actually take the orange pills and, uh, and, and we'll end up... He's my general manager. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we'll throw him on here in a minute. Heck sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And we'll actually just kind of singe them a little bit on the grill, and then um, so it gives a little bit of smoke flavor in the bitter itself. Yeah. That's interesting. I've not heard of something like that happening before. That definitely, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> this is, like you said, it goes down a little bit smoother. How much do you feel as though the going from whiskey to a barrel-aged gin changes the character of this? Uh, we, with the bitters? Y- well, the uh, the... Old fashioned itself. How much do you feel as though going from whiskey to the barrel aged gin changes the character? Um, well, because it's our, I mean, gin's already a little bit lighter than a natural whiskey, right? Mm-hmm. Especially one that's rye. Rye is heavier. Corn is obviously a lighter product in the farming community, period. E- even over potatoes, everybody, oh, what is a potato vodka? We all learned that from the Russians and then the Polish perfected it, right? But, but corn's already a much lighter farm agricultural product as it is so so it just makes it that much lighter of an old-fashioned instead of a heavier one 
It's like an old fashioned light kind See, of, right? Yeah, <laughs> basically. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's an interesting thing because that's why I asked it because I didn't know exactly what I was picking up on. But you think about beers that incorporate corn. It's specifically used to add a little bit of the alcohol component without adding too much more flavor. And I think that's probably why this is a lot more palatable, at least in not palatable, but a lot lighter in character is because of the, the corn component. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I assume this is a pretty popular drink for you guys. Yeah. Yeah, probably. And the, probably one of the ones that we're probably the most proud about behind the bar too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, as you should be, cause I, uh, I want to keep sipping it, which is always a good thing when yeah. you got a drink mm-hmm. in front of you. Right. Yeah, I am. I continue to sip it. <laughs> we're, we're walking you down Willy Wonka in the uh, booze factory. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we dig it. We dig mm-hmm. it for sure. Well, and this is a, a, a good way, and this is a perfect spot for it, to enjoy spirits because not only do you guys have, you know, the different varieties, the different fruited and infused ones. Um, <laughs> Thought my cap was on. Uh, dude, I did that yesterday with a bottle of barbecue sauce. I actually had barbecue sauce in my hair. No. I think a little bit of like an electrolyte drink would be better than barbecue sauce to yeah. toss around. I'm just around. getting yeah. my electrolytes going here before the day. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta stay hydrated, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah that, teamwork. Was, that is great teamwork, guys. <laughs> oh, well, it's not the first time anything's been spilt here, nor the last. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Um, but yeah, for, for people to come in and to enjoy this experience here, you know, this, this spot, especially in Old Town, may be mistaken mm. as kind of an area where it's a little bit more party, a little bit more For sure. getting drunk or intoxicated focus, whereas here there is so much more to it from the local citrus to the different flavors that you guys are incorporating to the experimentation with the barrel-aged gin. Is that something that you guys are trying to introduce a lot to people as well, or do people get that? Hands down. I mean, yeah, we, I mean, we, we love talking about our spirits and how they're made. That's why we're doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of people do look at Old Town, and of course, you have the, uh, the the party side, right? That's why I said earlier, like, they come here, they get the good craft cocktails, clean booze, and then you can go over there and drink a $9 well vodka that you're paying <laughs> mm-hmm. more than you're paying here, yeah. honestly. So, start the trip around Old Town here, and then end up at somewhere else, right? Well, and then Pretty come back. And then come, and then come back. back. <laughs> yeah, cause, yeah we're, o- we're open until, like, 1, 1 a.m. Sometimes uh, we'll, yeah. keep, we'll keep it going okay. if we got a good crowd in here, right? So Yeah. Very, uh, very uh, mom and pop top like fill here. And what about the snow cones? I see a snow cone machine. Are uh, those? Is there an alcohol infused snow cone? There you can pick any flavor, <laughs> any craft cocktail, and make it snow cone style. Really? Wow, yeah. that sounds incredible. Um, we're in, we're in, we're in. They're uh, massive too. We're right? in the hottest place in America. That's right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't have a snow cone machine, something's wrong. <laughs> well, something's wrong at my place because I don't have a snow cone machine. But now I, mean, I know a place know, to like, go for yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now Who you have needs a place one at to home come. when you can just come here and hang yeah. out for a day with snow cones. I like it. Yeah. How does that? How does that translate? Transition into like? Because I don't know. I just feel like it would melt the ice. I mean, it, it does. I mean, it's pretty much, it turns into like a, like a slushy. Slushy. Mm, okay. Basically. Okay. Yeah. Or a Slurpee. Yeah. 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 I'm good with that too. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah that, I'm sold on the idea of a <laughs> cocktail Slurpee. That sounds yeah. fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Now, all right, before we wrap up, I got it. So, so my sister was six years old. My sister is six years old. I mean, she used to kick my ass all the time. <laughs> now you guys have a sister that would kick your asses as well. <laughs> <laughs> Hands down. <laughs> Hands down. Oh, she's in great shape. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, she, she's um, definitely, I think she's given both of us black eyes before. Uh, I mean, is she younger? We're farm. Yeah, mm-hmm. she, he's the oldest, and uh, then uh, he's 18 months older than I am, and then she's 21 months younger than me. Okay. But she's lit, light, lit, but is it light or lit, lighted or lit? Lit you both up? But you oh, know, yeah. a bunch oh. <laughs> Absolutely. When we were sparring with her growing up, you know, and, and uh, I'll never forget when she was, we were sitting at the dinner table uh, for her first, this little side note right here. Yeah, no, this is uh, great. When she was getting ready for her, her first uh, contact fight because she wasn't quite 18 yet. And uh, so dad had to sign the, the waiver or whatever. And we were all sitting at dinner there. And my mom's like, no, no, no. My dad's name's Roger. Rog, don't let her do that. And I remember my dad said, now, Tammy, if she gets knocked out, it'll be the end of it, and she'll hate it. <laughs> but if she does good, I mean, you never know. You got to let her You gotta let her take that shot. Yeah. And, and uh, well, look what happened. Uh, you know, and, and her, her first, her first uh, 
love was kickboxing. Okay. And then, you know, then she got into boxing, became 18 time world boxing champion. 18 time world box. Dang. Yeah. And for those who don't know who Eric's talking about, it's <laughs> future UFC Hall of Famer, uh, Holly Holm, who, yeah. yep. you know, has had obviously a very, very legendary career. So, yeah. um, yeah, that's, that's a pretty incredible thing to grow up alongside, huh? Yeah. yeah. It's been very unique for our family. So we just made the spirit to um, celebrate it with everybody else. So Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Yeah. So did you want to get, uh, did you want to get your, your GM on? Have him talk? Cause he look, he, he, doesn't he, have he to. might be hung over. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so, well, so let, let, let's wrap it up. What, what's the, what's the vision of blue clover? Like, like what is the, what's the plan with this place? Well, I mean, distribution and, um, just getting our spit out there and just sharing the love for, for what we like to do. And, and really just embracing the community We're community driven people. Um, we, we love being the public eye. We've been like that our whole lives. We're preachers, kids too. Right? Yeah. And and uh, really just want to get something good out there that people know locally, that they know how it's actually made. Because there's a lot of stuff that you can, I mean, behind that well that you don't even know how it's made. Mm-hmm. You know, it's how it's marketed, right? Yeah. So we really just want people to know how it's really made and what they're actually drinking, right? Because I think it's very important in the booze industry. Well, yeah, this is a fantastic spot for anyone who's looking to kind of dig more into local spirits and learn a little bit about how they're created and uh, experiment a bit with what your taste profile looks like and try some um, novel flavors of not only the spirits themselves, but some cocktails. You said what are the cross streets again? Uh, Indian School and Marshall's Way in Old Town Scottsdale. Which is a little bit what west of uh, Scottsdale Road. Yeah, I like, I mean, Coach House. Uh, everybody knows Coach House, longest mm-hmm. running bar in Old Town. That's usually a pretty uh, well-known landmark. Actually, we share the same parking lot as they do. Okay. Um, so we're right across the street from them. Just on a short note, you can't miss the huge white metal rabbit, yeah. the one-eyed jack right uh, out, front, yeah. okay, out yeah. front of our door right here at the cross street. There it is. Just look for the big bunny. Yeah. The big bunny. Yeah. <laughs> and the four-leaf clover. Like that's, yeah. that's a good combo. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you guys have definitely got our seal of approval many times over, and thank you so much for having us in here, and everyone come and visit this place because it's an awesome little spot. Yeah, great to meet you guys. Appreciate it. Thanks for having Cheers. us on. You too. Thanks, guys.